Great, so I think we'll get started now. So welcome everyone to our webinar today, Practical Strategies to Support Elementary school Age Children with School Attendance. Um, my name is Michelle Horn. I'm the Program Manager for the BC Children's Kelty Mental Health Resource Centre. Uh, this webinar is a collaboration between BC Children's Hospital, Vancouver Child and Youth Mental Health, the Vancouver School Board, and the Kelty Mental Health Resource Centre. And just to note that your microphones have been muted automatically and your cameras are turned off so we can't see or hear you. Uh, so with just a brief overview of the Kelty Mental Health Resource Center before we begin. So the Kelty Mental Health Resource Center is a provincial mental health and substance use resource center. We help families across the province by helping you understand and navigate the mental health and substance use system by listening and offering peer support through parent peer support workers through a collaboration with Family Smart and connecting families to resources and tools. We will be putting our contact information up on the very last slide, uh, so you can jot that down then. Before we begin, just a few important notes. So the information in this webinar applies to the context in British Columbia, and some of the information is specific to the Vancouver School Board. If you are in another jurisdiction, or um, if you are in another jurisdiction, please consult local health and school authorities for further information. And also if you or your child or someone you care about is having a mental health or substance use crisis, right now, please call 911 or go to your local hospital's emergency room. A few housekeeping notes also before we begin. So as mentioned, everyone is automatically muted and your cameras are turned off. If you have any technical questions, such as you're having issues with sound or any comments about the content, please submit those through the chat icon. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. And at the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up that we invite you to complete. You'll also receive that survey link in a follow-up email that we'll send tomorrow. If you have any questions for the speakers, please submit those through the Q&A icon. So we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, and if you want to remain anonymous before submitting your question, uh, simply click on the Submit Anonymously button within your Q&A icon box. So this webinar is part of a larger series. Uh, part one was held earlier in the week and we'll be hosting another webinar on Monday, November 23rd that is focused on practical strategies to support school attendance in high school aged youth. So if you were wanting to register for that one happening on November 23rd, there's uh, the registration link on this slide and we'll also include that same link in the follow-up email that you'll be receiving tomorrow. Uh, we also wanted to, um, all the speakers and panelists today would like to acknowledge with immense gratitude that we all live, work, and play on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Great. And to introduce our speakers today. So we have three um, main presenters today. Dr. Sarah Anderson is a registered psychologist and postdoctoral fellow in the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Clinic at BC Children's Hospital and the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia, as well as a psychology associate at Cornerstone Child and Family Psychology Clinic. She provides clinical services to children, youth, and families and conducts research to better understand anxiety disorders. Dr. Anderson has a particular interest in supporting children and youth who experience difficulties attending or staying in school. Julie Collette is a registered clinical counselor and mental health and substance use clinician in the school liaison role with Vancouver Coastal Health, Child and Youth Mental Health. In this role, she provides clinical supports to children, youth, and families, as well as clinical consults with family permission with Vancouver School Board staff regarding students presenting with complex mental health needs. Julie specializes in collaborating across systems to provide wraparound care for families. And Paula Ferran is a registered clinical counselor and has worked as a teacher and counselor in various schools for the Vancouver School Board for over 20 years. Currently, Paula is a district counselor providing professional development for teachers on building the foundations of positive mental health through social and emotional learning and mental health literacy. We also have um, a panelist who will be joining the rest of the presenters for the question and answer session at the end of the formal presentation. Uh, so Dr. Rosalind Catchpole is the psychologist and clinic head for the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Clinic at BC Children's Hospital. So thank you so much to our presenters and our panelists today, and I'll pass it over to Dr. Anderson to begin the presentation.
Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. So as was mentioned, this is part two of a two-part series. So if you missed part one, the take-home message for that was really just to make sure that you're settled as a caregiver. So when you're feeling more calm and supported and when you have a good understanding of how anxiety shows up in your child, you'll be better able to support them with school attendance challenges. So we'll be speaking for about 40 minutes and then have some time for questions. We'll cover a brief overview of anxiety and how this shows up in elementary school age kids, general strategies to support anxious kids, building a team, harnessing support from your child's school, as well as concrete steps to help your child attend school. So this webinar is meant for families of elementary school age children who are having trouble with attending school who have chosen full-time in-class attendance. If you have chosen the learn from home transition option or are making decisions regarding your child's schooling, uh, this webinar may also be applicable. And we also recommend watching the recent webinar recording with myself and Dr. Catchpole developed in partnership with Kelty Mental Health titled Setting Children and Youth Up for a Successful Return to School in the era of COVID-19. So as was covered in part one, anxiety is a normal and adaptive human emotion. So a certain amount of anxiety is helpful, like being able to respond quickly to a car speeding towards you or feeling motivated to practice a presentation like this one. But sometimes anxiety is experienced as uncomfortable physical sensations like stomach aches or headaches or increased heart rate or breathing, as well as distressing emotions like panic or fear, as well as worry thoughts that indicate to us that something bad is going to happen and to avoid that thing. And while the experience of anxiety is often really uncomfortable, it's not harmful, and we can think of it as somewhat of a false alarm. So it sounds counterintuitive, but avoiding or eliminating anxiety is not what we want, whereas coping with or, or facing our fears is. And it's important to remember that learning to cope with stressors in elementary school is actually a really important goal that will set your child up for being able to cope with other challenges that they face in their life. In kids age 12 and under, we see a variety of different kinds of worries, such as worries about friendships, difficulty being away from parents, worries about certain subjects or perfectionism about academics, and difficulty speaking up in class, among others. And when kids are struggling to get to school, often there are other things that have happened along the way that might make it harder for them, like their sleep schedule being wonky or feeling nervous getting out of the house or learning challenges or social stressors. So when we're thinking about supporting kids' school attendance, it can be really, really challenging for parents to know where to start and how to help. So challenges with school non-attendance exist on a spectrum from attending school regularly and maybe experiencing a little bit of worry or expressing some occasional pushback all the way to not having attended for weeks or months. And this webinar really does apply to families of, of children at all stages of that spectrum. So we'll provide some practical supports that are the foundation to all levels of need and additional levels of intervention as well that may be required if your child hasn't been attending for a longer period of time. So the first step in this process is really about taking a holistic view of your child, starting with the areas that they're doing well in. So how is their sleep? Are they getting regular daily physical activity? Do they have friends or are they engaging academically? Or are any of these areas ones that they're struggling in? And I'm gonna say a little bit more about this in a minute. We also wanna look at how often they're getting to school. 
Are they attending consistently, missing a few classes, or haven't attended in weeks or months? It's important to take stock of what is going on right now when it's harder for them to get to school. So for example, are they always asking to leave during math time? Is it around a friend issue? Or when there's a performance demand like a presentation or a group discussion? And what was going on around the time when it first became difficult for your child to get to school? Was there a social conflict or some family challenges around that time? Also of importance, how distressed are you as a caregiver and how upset is your child when it's time to get off to school? So as discussed in part one, do you notice yourself balancing that scale of parenting between being too soft and giving in too much or too harsh and becoming angry or impatient? And two, we want to notice and look at non-judgmentally, what is my child doing when they're not in school? during school hours. Are they sleeping in? Are they on devices? Are they hanging out with you or getting extra attention? And very importantly, who is on you and your child's team? So whether they are professional supports like school staff, medical or mental health clinicians, or social and community supports like friends, neighbors, spiritual leaders or otherwise. We, we often see caregivers taking on the burden of trying to get their child back to school alone. And while you play a crucial role in this process, no one person can be the one to fix your child's challenges. And this really does require a coordinated team effort, or you may find yourself becoming really burnt out and exhausted. So setting the stage in step two is really looking at these four areas that are so important. And any one of these four areas can be a good place to start to address anxiety. As a mom to four now adult children, I appreciate and acknowledge that working towards a better balance with sleep, physical activity, screen use, or practicing anxiety management tips can be really hard to do. If you're struggling with this, please know we're all human and there is no perfect parent. And at the same time, research shows that attention to these four areas can significantly help in reducing anxiety overall and can set the stage for more successful planning for school attendance. So again, setting this stage with sleep. When is your child starting their bedtime routine? When are they falling asleep? When our kids' routines are really all over the place, it's extra challenging to get them to school. Or if they're staying up really late and then sleeping in, the same applies. The challenge is multiplied. If you are having challenges in any of these four areas, again, this doesn't make you a bad parent. We know that right now, in particular, routines are simply not the same, and families are stretched with all kinds of unprecedented demands. What we do hope to convey is that sleep is one of the most crucial areas of well-being, and poor sleep habits affect many other areas of functioning in all of us, not just our kids, such as emotional regulation and focus and concentration. So if you've identified sleep as a concern for your child, here are a few strategies that might help, such as making the bedroom cool and dark at bedtime and only using or allowing the use of the bed for sleeping and limiting stimulating activities before bed and maintaining a consistent bedtime routine and consistent sleep and wake schedule on weekdays as well as weekends to avoid that weekly so-called jet lag. So bedtime routines should consist of three to five simple steps and end in the child's bedroom. And for younger children, charts or picture schedules may be helpful for remembering the steps of the routine. If your child has continued challenges getting to sleep or staying asleep, there are ways to help. 
Gradual independence is a strategy caregivers can use, which involves gradually decreasing parental presence at bedtime. For example, if your child currently requires you to sleep in their bed, step one may be sleeping in your child's bed until they are asleep. Step two may involve sitting beside the bed. Step three, sitting on the other side of the bedroom door. Gradual independence may also involve putting your child to bed and returning to check on them at increasing intervals. It is recommended that you gently ignore mild behaviors such as whining or negotiating and minimize interactions with your child after their bedtime. So one strategy, a bedroom ticket, is a very effective strategy if your child is able to fall asleep alone but is waking and getting up in the night. For example, if your child gets up five times a night, they get five tickets, and those tickets can get handed in or handed over every time they get up in the night. If they don't use their tickets, they can cash them in for money or small rewards, such as stickers or even candy. Small daily rewards are so important. If your child has specific fears related to bedtime, such as a monster under their bed, you can work to gradually face those fears during the day and then at night, such as by having a flashlight treasure hunt in the closet. You may also incorporate pretend play with younger children to better understand their fears and find out, is it about the dark? Is it about separating from you? So again, rewards are an integral part of this work whether they are immediately given in the morning after a success the night prior, or whether your child is earning tokens towards a larger reward, such as one-to-one -one time with you, the caregiver, or a special outing. And don't underestimate the power of one-to-one -one time with you, especially when there are other siblings in the house. So again, setting the stage for school attendance Another area that may be a good place to focus is physical activity. Research shows that physical activity is one of the best treatments for anxiety and low mood. This might involve getting out for a walk or a bike ride, running around at recess, or another activity your child enjoys. Activities as a family are a great way to make this fun. So setting the stage in these areas sets a, a really good foundation for school. And don't worry, we're getting to those practical tips about school as well. So problematic screen use is another behavior that often occurs alongside or maybe contributing to challenges getting to school. So it's important to clarify here that we're not suggesting that all screen time is bad. And in light of our current circumstances, most families are using screens much more than prior to COVID, um, whether that's for productive use or for entertainment. And all kids have some screens in their life. And for some kids, this is actually can be a really helpful reward. So what we recommend is first taking a, a critical big picture look at your child's screen use. So how much time are they spending on screens? And, and better yet, how are they using their screens? Is it for school? Is it for productive play or social engagement? Is it for social media? And do you have family guidelines about screen use? And, and if you do, are those being followed? If you take a look at this information and, and you feel it based on this, your child's screen use is problematic, Develop a plan by first deciding on the limits of their use and implementing that plan. And you could also do things like setting no tech times during meals or at bedtime. Some families also find it helpful to draw up um, something like a technology use contract, which allows kids a say in their use, but also allows parents the opportunity to set limits and predetermine consequences for misuse. It's also worth us taking a hard look inward at our own usage. And again, no one's perfect, but there are ways that, that we might be able to modify our use to model healthy usage. 
So we've put a link in the resources section at the end of this talk to Dr. Jimmy Kang's website if you're interested in further ways to navigate technology use in your household. So in setting the stage for your child's success with school attendance, there are also a number of small strategies that you can implement to help support. So this is a, a brief overview of preventative strategies um, that are also a, a helpful foundation to the steps we'll be talking about later in this webinar. Caregivers can use gentle encouragement for their children to face fears in small chunks. So it may be that um, your child with separation anxiety is not yet ready to separate quickly on the school grounds, but perhaps they are able to separate if you first start by meeting with a friend or having another parent walk them from the car to the school entrance. It's also important to provide praise and positive reinforcement for these successes, no matter how small those successes might be. And being really specific with your praise. So not just saying, good job, but saying, good job, and I'm so proud of you for facing your fear and saying goodbye to mommy before school. I know that was hard for you, but you were able to be brave and to do it. And maybe even using rewards, whether those are small and, and sustainable rewards like stickers um, or tokens towards a fun activity or a special prize. And the flip side to this is ignoring some of those mild behaviors like your child dragging their feet while you're walking into school together and really, really playing up the praise and the positives. And those are the things that are gonna amplify those benefits of, of being brave and facing fears. You can also help your child decatastrophize minor setbacks in a, in a calm way as a supportive strategy. And it can be helpful to develop some brave tips with your child to use during times like this, such as um, like reminders of a time when they did a hard thing and they had fun anyway, or a time when they were proud of themselves for facing their fear. And as I mentioned, we wanna make sure your, your kids experience success, even if it's a teeny tiny step. And that might mean allowing for a bit of extra time for some tasks, as, as well as trying to create those optimal or optimal as possible environments for success by making our routines as regular and predictable as possible and introducing some structure where we can, although that's challenging right now. That predictability and consistency piece is, is really key to helping eliminate some of that uncertainty for your child. And we know that when we're, any of us, when we're in a heightened state of anxiety, focusing on what we can control rather than what's outside of our hands really, really does help. So step three, is all about talking to your child's school. And caregivers can reach out to the classroom teacher first and share information. The classroom teacher will likely already be aware that your child is struggling. And parents are such a valuable source of information. And what you know as a parent about your child can complement what the teacher sees in the classroom. You are the expert on your child. And sharing information early in the process with teachers and other personnel involved with your child helps build a clear picture on what might be a barrier to attendance and what supports might be appropriate. The classroom teacher will likely utilize universal supports that build school connectedness and a sense of belonging in the school community. And this includes social and emotional learning curriculum to teach emotional literacy, which is so important for all students. So for that more intensive collaboration, classroom teachers may access their school-based team to help problem solve and explore additional supports to classroom strategies for individual students. School-based team members may include resource teachers, school counselors and school psychologists and speech language pathologists. Other school staff connected with the student may be invited to be part of the team as well. And this could include support staff, Indigenous education enhancement workers, 
multicultural workers, district staff, and other community school team workers. And depending on the child's situation, different school staff may be involved too. For example, if your child is new to Canada or is an English language learner, the multicultural worker or settlement worker may be part of the team to support your child and your family to gain comfort and connectedness in the school and in the community. So the school-based team discussion may explore possible learning complexities, social, emotional, and behavior supports and challenges. And the team may recommend small psychoeducational groups and individual interventions too, such as additional testing or specific supports from district school personnel, such as the counselor, speech language pathologists, or school psychologists. And some students also have an individual education plan to support their learning or their social emotional goals. So this meeting with the caregiver and the school meetings help build supportive and collaborative plans for your children. And if medical or mental health professionals are involved, regular communication between the school, home and medical and mental health team is so vital for that consistent planning and updating information. Individual plans may be living documents that are flexible in nature and shift according to individual well being goals and on team reviews of the progress of your child. They may also include environmental changes like flexible seating or visual schedules, or even a plan B where students can practice coping strategies in alternate school spaces or something like a check in or check out system with a designated school staff member, like the school counselor. So caregivers may also discuss with the school possible gradual entry plans to build on student successes and review any academic concerns that you may have. We know that attendance and well being are so foundational for building academic success. And individual plans will vary and may focus on building strengths, problem solving and coping skills. And the adult team will plan to support students to move forward with the developed plans and foster developmentally appropriate independence and autonomy. So the next step, step four in supporting your child's school attendance is making a plan that's feasible for you and for your child and for your team. And by feasible, I mean one that you can realistically follow through with and has steps that are reasonable for your child and not too much of a stretch from where they're functioning at the moment. So this often involves really careful coordination with your child's school and keeping the line of communication regular and open as Paula mentioned. And depending on how long these challenges have been going on for and how much school your child has missed, that will determine where to start with a plan. So for example, if your child hasn't attended school for weeks, it wouldn't be reasonable to expect the first step to be attending a few hours of class. Um, but it might be reasonable for your child to visit the school grounds or meet with a friend or a trusted school staff member. Just as we earlier spoke about the variation in, in how long and how much your child's uh, challenges with school attendance are impacting them, the intensity of the intervention will also vary. So while practical or um, prevention strategies, more of those setting the stage strategies might be sufficient for kids on the left side of the spectrum. Um, kids that have more moderate to severe challenges with school attendance will require an equally comprehensive, intensive, and really coordinated intervention. And of course, this is not a cookie cutter plan, and it always depends on the, the individual needs of your child. Um, so for example, your child may have other needs and challenges that necessitate more intervention and support than the spectrum here indicates. As part of this process of making a plan, um, and depending on your child's age, 
goal setting together is important in, in building your child's motivation and buy-in to the plan. So this might involve first determining your non-negotiables as a caregiver, and then providing your child with some choices that are within those limits, such as which teacher or staff member they'd like to visit first or what snack they'd like to pack for their first day attending recess in a few weeks. And really communicating both that validation and that encouragement as discussed in part one. So this is really integral to helping instill confidence in your child and increase their chance of success. So you might try acknowledging how hard the task is for them while at the same time supporting them approaching that difficult thing. So you could say something like, thanks for telling me you don't want to go to school. I hear that you really don't like it. Remember when you told me that you want to decorate your holiday craft with your friends? How about we work together to being at school for that? So how do you break the cycle of non-attendance and, and what does this look like in practice? So if you ask your child to do something they're worried about, their anxiety will initially increase, which of course is really hard to see as a parent. However, at its peak, our bodies can't sustain that high level of anxiety for long. And the anxiety will come down on its own as your child stays in that situation. However, let's say for example, your child is worried and is nagging you and negotiating about going to school on the morning of. Their anxiety is increasing in that moment. And then you say, okay, fine. You don't have to go to school today, but you have to go tomorrow. Your child's gonna experience an immediate sense of relief and a decrease in their anxiety. But without having had the opportunity for that anxiety to come down on its own and for them to be able to face that thing they're afraid of. So the message they're left with is, I feel better. My anxiety went away because I didn't have to face that hard thing. The second or third or fourth time um, that child who faces their fears is put in that anxiety provoking situation, their anxiety will be a little bit less than the time before and will similarly go down on its own. And after many repeated practices or exposures, uh, the anxiety will continue to decrease on its own until it's manageable and may no longer even be a concern. However, the, the child who avoided facing their fear, such as the child whose really well-meaning parent allowed them to stay home, will experience even more anxiety the next time they're asked to face their fear and go to school and will be even more hard pressed to get to school. So what we're, we're seeking to do here is we're seeking to get rid of that avoidance not that anxiety. And we're also looking to minimize or decrease that overwhelming nature of anxiety. So here's an example of a school attendance ladder. Um, so this involves setting really specific, uh, realistic steps towards a larger goal. Um, for example, of going to school full-time or being at school full-time. So which step you begin with depends on how challenged your child has been getting to school um, and how long they've been away. So when you're making this plan and developing steps on the ladder, um, keep in mind both goals for time at school, as well as goals for participating in different activities or different classwork at school. So for example, if your child is, is most hard pressed to participate in social activities at school, and this is driving a lot of their anxiety, uh, having them attend recess with their peers without support might be a, a later step on the ladder. And we typically recommend that each step be practiced um, at least a few times before moving on to the next step, just to make sure that your child has really fully mastered that step. 
and completing each step would ideally be followed by a reward. So either an immediate reward, like a sticker or a candy, or a token to work up to something else, like a special activity. And moving through these steps incrementally, step by step, is, is really important and, and making sure not to move through the steps too fast, but also not getting stuck on, on one step for weeks or months. And if you notice that that jump to a next step is, is too overwhelming for your child, try to identify if there's an in-between step or even multiple in-between steps that they could move to uh, next instead. So in this slide, we are talking about helpful versus unhelpful things to say. Sometimes as parents, with the best of intentions, we might say something that's unhelpful, not realizing the impact on our child. And we all do this. We all say unhelpful things from time to time. As a clinician, I am frequently asked, so what do I say in the moment? We want to remember the two-pronged response of validation and confidence, as Sarah was mentioning earlier. So note the helpful and unhelpful scripts in this slide. Note the difference in the messages and how they make you feel when you read them. So for example, the helpful or outside voice is, I know how difficult this is for you and I know you can do it. Let's walk to the car together. Versus the unhelpful or inside voice might say, you were able to go to school yesterday, I'm really late and need to go. Versus the helpful or outside voice, I can see you're really trying. I'm so proud of you for getting your backpack ready. Versus, I'm disappointed that you've missed so much school. When I was in school, this would, wouldn't have even been an option. So this, this is a very important uh, script to have inside our heads to help us in those moments. And again, sometimes we think that we are helpful and we are inadvertently sending a different message than we intend. For example, this may sound counterintuitive, yet imagine if you were the manager and your employee comes late one day. You might talk with them, explain that the business requires them to be on time. The employee nods in agreement and then the next day they're late again. You discuss again with them, maybe this time bringing them into your office, telling them about the need for them to be on time. They nod yes, and yet the pattern repeats itself for days, weeks, or even months. Consider what message you as the manager are sending. Is it, I need you to be at work on time? Or do you actually seem to be saying, I want you to be at work on time, but I have no idea how to make sure that you do that. So before we can effectively act, we need to shift our perhaps inadvertent reinforcing of the message that there's nothing effective we can do. So this is where you as a parent or caregiver can collaboratively work together with the school and mental health professionals or medical professionals if they're involved and give the message that there is something that can be done. And at the same time, it's okay that it will take small, slow steps. So what if my child is at home? So many of you watching right now are facing this exact situation. Your child may be at home, not attending at all, despite your family's decision to have them attend. The key message here is watch out for any things that make it extra fun or nice to stay home in an effort to protect your child from distress. I know as a mother, how it feels when we witness our child upset, perhaps crying in frustration or fear. Or on the other hand, we may see a child get really angry with emotional outbursts and perhaps punch walls or throw objects in what we call externalizing behaviors when highly anxious. This is really tough to experience ourselves. Our instincts as caregivers is to protect, to make it stop, or to make it better. What we want to do instead 
again, is almost counterintuitive. We want to shift from protecting to supporting. Protect might look like making a special breakfast for a child who stays home. While this is a caregiving tendency, it inadvertently reinforces that behavior and your child staying home. So in supporting your child's school attendance, a really clear delineation of roles is, is really, really critical here to preventing burnout for you and, and all parties involved and for creating appropriate expectations. So that coordination and consistent messaging is, is really key. And, and therefore, it's really important to make sure everyone involved is very clear about their responsibilities for supporting your child's school attendance. So as a caregiver, you're responsible for communicating that confidence in your child that we've discussed. And also making sure that the home setting is as boring as possible during school hours, as well as ensuring as much as you can that your child is getting enough sleep and is awake and out the door in time to get to school. Your child is really just responsible for being brave and getting to school, and that's a big task in and of itself. The school or the school team is responsible for supporting and developing a school reintegration plan, or in some cases, an individualized education plan or an IEP. They're also responsible for setting up school team meetings with all players and liaising with mental health or medical health professionals if those parties are involved. And if there is a mental health clinician, they're responsible for providing that therapy either individually to your child or with your larger family or to yourself as a caregiver and to consult with the school team and to help develop those school reintegration plans or sometimes help support those individualized education plans as well and to attend those school team meetings. So as a caregiver, there's really a lot that we're asking you to do here. And, and sometimes additional support from a mental health professional can help. So whether that's getting support to help set limits with your child, to problem solve with them, or to respond to anxiety-driven behavior effectively, um, or whether that's getting your own individual support as a caregiver. So um, different options available are things like Child and Youth, your local Child and Youth Mental Health or CYMH. Here to Help is a great resource, or if you have access to an employee and family assistance program or a private therapist. And Kelty Mental Health can also help you navigate this and find services that might be a good fit for you. Individual therapeutic support from a mental health clinician may also be warranted for your child, especially to target um, if there are other or more intensive mental health challenges. So depending on your child's needs, um, there may be individual mental health support and there may also be medical or, or psychiatric management that's required as well on an ongoing basis. And we also see that um, oftentimes there are kids who have a legitimate physical health condition that may have led to them having challenges with school attendance to begin with. And that ongoing management of those concerns is, is really helpful in getting them set up for success for, for attending school. So what we hope you take from this webinar today is that facing your fears, it's hard work. It can be distressing, it can be un uncomfortable, but it's not harmful, particularly when everything is done at a manageable pace with good supports and collaboration. Also identifying those key team members is really, really important, whether those are professional supports or personal supports in order to prevent your own burnout and also in order to create that consistent messaging with all parties involved in supporting your child. 
you are such an essential part of this process. And so we really stress getting support that you need, whether that's from a friend, a spiritual leader, a partner, whoever it might be, that you can kind of gain and fill your bucket up, so to speak, through this difficult process. You can expect some anxiety while you're doing this from your child and probably from yourself as well, because this is hard work. But what we really, really, really want to make clear here is that there is hope. Your kids can flourish. These strategies really, really do work and it can and it will get better. We've included some resources here um, that the Kelty team will also send out to our viewers um, in the coming days. So the first one here, Confident Parents Thriving Kids, has two different modules, one for more anxiety-driven concerns and one for more behavior-driven concerns for kids 12 and under. We also really recommend um, Dr. Eli Leibowitz's book, Treating Childhood and Adolescent Anxiety, A Guide for Caregivers, as a really, really great resource. Anxiety Canada and Kelty Mental Health are also amazing go-to resources for topics of, of many different variations. And as we mentioned earlier, Dr. Shimmy Kang's uh, website speaks more to technology use and how to navigate that in your household. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson and Julie and Paula. What uh, what a great presentation with so many helpful tips for parents and caregivers. Uh, so now we have an opportunity for you to ask your questions. So thank you for everyone who has already submitted a question through the q and I see that there is a lot there. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Catchpole to join in as a panelist for this Q&A session. So thank you, Dr. Catchpole. Uh, so we'll get right into it so we can get to as many questions as we can. So the first one is, how do you deal with a child who is highly sensitive and also has some school anxiety? Great, Dr. Anderson. So I just want to start off by saying I so empathize with you because it can be so hard to know just where do I start when it when my child has that sensitive temperament where I might have already tried some of the things that we discussed today. Um, but I would say if it's if it's school based anxiety really starting from that step one to first determine what might be those primary drivers of their anxiety? Is it something that's more social related or performance related? Is it something to do with the academics that are maybe challenging for them or they're avoiding that piece? Getting a really good understanding of that. And then some of these pieces we've discussed are worth taking a hard look at. What, what's going on um, if your child is staying at home um, during school hours that might be, again, not purposefully uh, reinforcing them to want to stay away from school. And most importantly, connecting with your school team as early as possible, if you haven't already, and just coordinating what kinds of supports might be available for your child at school. Great, Dr. Catchpole. I'll just add a couple of things. I think the first thing to remember is, it's not bad to be a highly sensitive kid. Highly sensitive kids have amazing imaginations usually and are super empathetic and are great friends and make awesome adults. But what it does mean is that biologically, the wiring is just a bit more sensitive, which means that more things tend to get that anxiety response um, going. And so sometimes, again, we don't know, obviously, from this specific question, but, you know, if things are sort of feeling more intense, like they're anxious a lot of the time, these are kids that sometimes benefit from some targeted mental health support to really learn how to kind of manage that anxiety. You know, what are worried thoughts? How do they get in the way? And, and these kids often do really beautifully with that. Um, and then the other point I would just make is the more sensitive our biology is, the more those sort of foundational self-care strategies really matter like the exercise to actually burn off a bit of that extra nervous energy um, and the sleep and things like that. Love those kids. 
Great, thank you. So the next question is in regards to a grade one child who is adjusting well to grade one after a rougher kindergarten in the classroom, however, is having some difficulty navigating the playground. So he's going up and asking kids to play rather than just joining in and, and kind of struggling with the, the playground. Uh, Julie? Yeah. Well, I was gonna say this sounds like uh, an example where speaking with the school counselor and the school teacher and working together to come up with a plan that the teacher could support the, your child to um, have a few key kids that have been identified that are sort of recess buddies or whatnot. So again, coming up with a plan that might uh, support your child to not have to navigate the playground all on his own uh, or her own and have, uh, again, a plan with the teacher or the school counselor that may support your child to, um, to start out with success and then build on that success so that he could expand it to other children in the playground. So I think, again, going back to the teacher um, or maybe the school counselor is a good place to start uh, with this one. The other thing that's nice with the, oh, sorry. The other thing that's nice with grade one kids is we can often do a lot of role play because they're still quite playful. And so that's so sweet. He wants to, you know, ask if he can play, but sometimes just practicing like, oh, I'm here playing. Like, how would you join? And, and that's something as a, I mean, schools can help with that too, but that's something as a caregiver that, you know, can be really nice because sometimes they just need a little bit of that skill. And it's great that he's done well in the classroom this year. So you're, you're seeing growth, growth already. And Dr. Anderson, was there something you'd like to add as well? No, I was just going to add the same. And I guess on that as well, like sometimes um, whether it's role playing or even like a little social story or something that's written out, if if your child's just having some challenges, kind of picking up on that on those cues or knowing kind of how to appropriately engage with a social situation, um, maybe kind of walking them through it in a really simple way, like through pictures that are written down. So they understand more of the, the steps and the nuances involved in that kind of process. Okay, so the next question is uh, from a parent of a child in grade one who is struggling with going to school and has admitted that he doesn't want to go, go to school because he wants to stay at home with the mom um, and he just wants to be with, with the mom. So the mom's struggling because um, she just wants him to feel connected, um, but this seems to almost cause that anxiety and this happens not just with school but other activities like soccer as well. First of all, it's, it's so nice that your child just really wants to spend so much time with you. And that's so hard as a caregiver to have that kind of push and pull and, and that balance of, uh, on one hand, my child is saying to me, I just want to be with you all the time. I feel so safe with you. I feel so comfortable with you. Um, but on the other hand, it sounds like you've really identified, oh gosh, this is getting in the way of my child, you know, going to school and participating in other kinds of activities. Um, and so I would say the first place to look would be, how is that maybe reinforcing them staying home from school? So are there some ways that if, if that behavior is happening, if they are spending time with you outside of school, that you might be able to distance a little bit from them? Is there someone else in the household that might be able to be there during those times when your child is at home so that it's not as reinforcing for them or not as rewarding for them because they're kind of getting to spend that special time with you? Um, are there other things that might be happening during that time when they're at home? Like, are they getting, you know, a nice hot lunch or, you know, getting to run errands with you or getting to play games, which again, it's all understandable things um, that parents do, but it just kind of creates that little bit of an edge that makes it that much harder for your kid to re-engage with going back to school or participating in other activities. I, I always like to give the example, like for, for any of us in our jobs, um, if we had the option to um, not work and to stay at home and to, you know, have some nice alone time, watch Netflix, have a bath, eat candies, and there was no consequences for us, many of us would probably do a little bit of that some of the time. So it's just worth having that same kind of lens when you're thinking about some things that might be helpful for getting your kid back to school. Yeah. Oh, 
I was just going to add, thank you, you reminded me, I was going to say, given that it's gone on and off for several years, that it sounds like it may be a little bit further along on that spectrum um, that we were talking about. And so perhaps exploring getting outside supports, uh, given it has been going on a long time, in addition to all of the things that Sarah has talked about. Uh, so trying a multi-pronged approach in this case, uh, given the amount of time it's gone on, may be helpful. Great. Okay, and there's a few questions around rewards that I wanted to um, get to. So the first one was, um, how do you help a child when rewards just don't work? And it's not that they don't want to, it's not due to lack of motivation, it's just that they can't due to their anxiety. Dr. Catchpole? Yeah, so I, I can start. I think I get this question a lot and it, I would say it's very rare in the end that a kid isn't motivated by rewards. Often the challenge is the step is too big. And I always use this analogy. I'm really afraid of heights. So you could offer me like a million dollars and I'm not going bungee jumping. But if you offer me a million dollars to like go on a bridge, okay, well, I'll go for that, right? So sometimes it's about really kind of taking stock of where those anxieties are. And it might just be that at this point, we're sort of asking the impossible and we need to break it down a little bit more. Um, the other thing that can happen with rewards sometimes is the kids are nervous just sort of talking about the fact that they're nervous. And so talking about rewards and a system and a plan is actually kind of talking about the anxiety. So for some kids, you know, they, they do well with just sort of a low key approach, like, hey, awesome job at school. Let's go for an ice cream um, rather than, OK, here's another sticker on your chart. Um, so and then again, I think it, because we're not going to get to all these questions and I'm reading them, they're all so good. I would just make the general point that if you've tried the basics and you've connected with school and you're still finding it's hard, it might be that you need to add someone else to your team. And it might be that a little bit of, you know, mental health support to help fine tune some of these things or a little bit of extra support from school, you know, to kind of help problem solve might be where you're at. Great, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, so a parent who is uh, having a child who's having tummy aches from anxiety, uh, and that's the reason for them not going to school. Um, so when the parent says, you know, I know how it feels, uh, I don't feel scary to go to school, it ends up in an argument that no, we don't know how it feels. So any guidance for having that conversation? I, I will give an analogy here. When I'm nervous about something, it's fine for me to problem solve early on and get some validation, but right before I have to do it, I don't want anyone to talk to me about it. And so sometimes what happens in the mornings is if you say, oh, you know, we, we know it's hard and your tummy's hurting, that might actually just be sort of upping the anxiety. And that's where a little bit of distraction and just kind of getting going in those moments can be helpful, which isn't, I saw another question, which isn't that we don't validate our kids emotions it's just that sometimes when it's sort of go time or it's the morning of it's not as helpful to kind of get into the the weeds of that it's a little more like okay which shoes are you gonna wear all right oh what do you want for breakfast hey oh I found a cool thing in the car let's go look and just kind of keeping them moving great thank you and I did um, notice that there was quite a few questions around screen time and screen use at home and just wanted to um, mention that we just released podcast uh, yesterday on um, healthy tech at home uh, through the Kelty Center and um, one of my colleagues has put the link up in the chat box if you want to check out that out which goes through um, you know different ages and how to navigate screen use at home as well as how much screen time per age and some of the questions that came up in the Q&A. Um, and we're at one o'clock, so I think we'll have to end it there. I did want to mention there were so many great questions. It's, it's a shame we weren't able to get to them all today. Um, however, if we didn't get to your question, please don't hesitate to contact us at the Kelty Center. Our email address is keltycenter at cw.bc.ca. And we have our phone number up on the screen as well, 1-800-665-1822. Uh, we have folks that are there answering the phone and responding to emails who would be more than happy to um, help answer your questions that we didn't get to. Um, so thank you to everyone, all the attendees for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers and our panelists. Um, we hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Um, there is a survey that will pop up once this webinar is closed that we really encourage you to complete. It will really help us with future webinars. Um, and we'll also provide the link to that survey in our follow up email that will go out tomorrow, uh, along with a list of resources that were on the resources slide. So thank you so much for attending.